I hope everything is go okay today but not <laughs> just state of you uh, well anyway who is not here now with us we'll listen in record okay uh, today I will talk to you about functionalization of nanoparticles but not just functionalization because it's relatively easy topic uh, but from nanotoxicological perspective so now uh, before we start again if something happened uh, I mean technical issues or something like this you are free to put any messages in chat as well as questions of course uh, so now uh, before we even start I want to remind you about our schedule so uh, today there will be no uh, zoom session so the first zoom session with presentation will be this Friday uh, Friday the 4th uh, after the lecture uh, four of you I remind uh, Alexander Pridzina Anastasia Beliaeva, Maria Gorshkova and Alina Loktiva. So uh, they should uh, present their topics. Uh, again, uh, five minutes presentation and you should also uh, give your report in, uh, I mean, some, some, some words. So no more than five lists of text. Uh, and uh, you're free to download them in a common Google folder. So uh, the same folder uh, where you found your uh, topics so google table with topics so in the same folder student reports you can download your presentation and reports uh, and you, of course you can make a separate folder for each of you uh, okay so this friday will be four people uh, next tuesday will be three people uh, or maybe four so uh, i will ask you now if anyone want to volunteer for the next tuesday if no one will say me a word in the chat that i want to give uh, i want to present my topic uh, next tuesday i will pick random day again in the end of this lecture uh, so the Friday 11 again for people and uh, the last uh, well no, no, not the last but uh, last for uh, last three people should present their topics on Wednesday uh, 16 and the last chance the very last chance will be during the consultation so before the exam all of you should present their topics uh, so consultation is the last chance uh, if you do not present your topics uh, before this uh, let me as a pointer so if you not present your presentation before the uh, before the exam well you receive zero points and uh, again in the middle of this lecture maybe in 40 minutes or 50 minutes something like this you will have a test so in the middle of the lecture do not miss I will send a link in the chat of course I will give you a 25 minutes and so on but this is the first test uh, which will be uh, counted in your final mark so please please be here uh, and well uh, uh, let us start uh, so functionalization what is functionalization when you obtain some of the particles uh, it doesn't matter what the particle is uh, okay Anastasia want to give uh, well I will reach out a, a, bit, a bit later uh, when we have some break on testing uh, if uh, if you have, it doesn't matter if you obtain your particle using uh, from organic or inorganic uh, molecules or elements or something like this, uh, the next step may, may be a functionalization. So uh, functionalization it's uh, addition of obviously functions to your particles because well some particles have some functions uh, right from the bottle. So when you synthesize gold nanoparticles, they already have some surface plasma resonance uh, abilities some uh, optical uh, optical features but if you want for example to add some targeting mo moieties so if you want to target them precisely to different organs or accumulate in tumors or something like this you need to add something to your particles uh, and if you look on different it's uh, a, a lot of them but maybe it's not all of the uh, functionalization strategies but uh, at least most of them. Uh, if you look, uh, there's uh, of course drugs of different kinds uh, that you can use uh, and add to your particles to treat tumors, cancer, or other diseases. Uh, it's uh, antibodies, uh, obviously, for different uh, targeting and delivery applications. 
different kind of DNA RNA molecules. So it can be silencing RNA, it can be single strain DNA, uh, and uh, maybe even double strain DNA. So DNA, uh, some DNA additions for maybe delivering, maybe for, uh, for as a drug uh, moiety, but still different uh, nuclear acids. Uh, of course, it can be fluorescent dyes. So fluorescent dye uh, used for improving visualization. So you can add some <clears throat> some fluorescent molecules to uh, and the targeting moieties to visualize your particles when they accumulate in some uh, again in tumors maybe or in uh, I don't know thromboses or clots. Uh, of course, it can be something uh, not very uh, not connected with uh, treating with drugs, but also very important. Uh, it's like uh, peptides or polymers. So polyethylene glycol is a uh, very uh, important and uh, uh, one of the most used uh, polymers in functionalization of particles, and we will discuss in detail this polymer. Uh, and mainly it used for such uh, for such moiety as shielding. So it shield particles from plasma proteins, from absorbing by macrophages, cupfer cells, and so on. So uh, uh, along with PEG, there's a lot of other strategies and other polymers uh, which used and have biocompatible properties and so on. Now, there are also some tumor markers. So tumor markers as well as antibodies can be used to target tumors. Uh, aptamers can be uh, added, added uh, in one group with the RNA because aptamers is a short uh, nucleic acid uh, sequences. And uh, of course, it's some kind of dendimer. So, dendimers also can be called polymer uh, and also used for improving stability and so on. So, main uh, functionalization strategies listed here. So, basically, it's again. Uh, targeting and delivery uh, usually come together. It's shielding, so protecting of your nanoparticles from being degraded, absorbed, uh, or some kind of uh, uh, un un unwilling effects in the body. And uh, of course, it's lowering of toxicity because almost all nanoparticles are toxic, and we will discuss in detail this. Uh, maybe uh, in uh, a couple of lectures and improving stability because not every particle is very stable uh, under biological conditions in um, some uh, biological media, especially in blood. Uh, and of course, it's visualization and improving physical response. So improving physical response is mainly <coughs> associated with addition of some molecules, for example, for Raman scattering. So it's some molecules which can enhance goal ability to enhance uh, surf uh, surface uh, Raman scattering, uh, but uh, this is a very tricky question and uh, not uh, for just biomedical application, but uh, for some more for some physical and pure biological applications. So, if you are interested in uh, 30 years of biofunctionalization of particles, there's a good review uh, which are stating, like, well, all of the history of nanoparticles, but. Uh, anyway, I will give you just uh, maybe one slide about history of functionalization. It's it's not very interesting or important, uh, but it's uh, you should know that some of the uh, particles and types of functionalization which we are still using now, uh, they are not uh, in terms of uh, science and uh, speed of which science is developing. Uh, some of these uh, strategies is not just uh, old, they are al almost ancient. Because, for example, liposomes, it's 1960, and dendrimers, uh, uh, it's like 78, and pigulated, uh, pig pigulation and pigulated lip liposomes, uh, it's like already 40 years ago uh, since the development. Uh, so, uh, PLJ and PLJ, PLJ uh, nanoparticles, uh, they are also like 94. Uh, 1994, and uh, if we look on most successful drugs which used some functionalization and can be called nano drugs, nano formulation like uh, eptexane, abroxane, it's a uh, uh, let's say covered, uh, it's some uh, drugs which are used in uh, prote uh, protein modification, and it's like already 15 years past. And if we look on very recent strategies for functionalization, I bet no one of you ever heard of this, even I uh, sometimes never heard of some of these things. So uh, uh, 
it's very interesting that uh, despite uh, some of the strategies for de were developed uh, like maybe 40 30 years ago uh, only now they finally came they uh, find their place in market so there's some pegylated drugs there's some uh, percorted drugs but as for this advanced approaches which are developed uh, like maybe developed like five or six seven years ago we sh probably should wait another 10 20 years for them to come into market if they uh, will ever come to market uh, and uh, well so we need to start from something very familiar to probably <coughs> every one of you it's a pigulation so pigulation it's a process of covering your particles with PEC, so polyethylene and glycol. Uh, PEC, uh, um, well, pegylation, like maybe even uh, 10, 15 years ago, well, as you can see, it's like a 40 years history, but even uh, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, pegylation was everything. So if you need to do something with your particle, pegylation. If you need to increase half-life, pegylation. Reduce degradation in culture media, in physiological media, pegylation. If you need to reduce clearance uh, by kidneys or liver, pegylation. So if you want any of uh, biomedical application from your particles, you need to pegylate them. And well, this result in, uh, result in some findings because it was believed that PEG is fully biocompatible and there's no drawbacks of pegylation until some moment because of course of course everything can be so so good that there's no uh, drawbacks of pegylation uh, but uh, there is some problem with our let's say imagination because if you look on pegylation uh, uh, i mean pictures of pegylated particles usually they presented something like this uh, because gold nanoparticle with silica shell, some uh, hydroxyl groups on the surface, uh, and if there's some uh, pack on the surface, it will be like uh, well, some 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 kind of springs on the surface. Uh, not very frequent, not very uh, not very long, but still some pegylation. But uh, obviously, it's not true. So pegylation can be represented in many ways, and this is uh, why this is uh, so important because you need to understand what the pegylated particle really looks like. Uh, pegylation can be represented something like this one. So it's just a protein with a peg. So it's just a molecule, some chemical structure of this peg, uh, and this gives nothing for your imagination to understand how this protein will really looks like, especially in blood. Uh, so the next is some kind of pegylated molecules on the surface of particle and uh, just compare the length of the uh, uh, pack molecules and the size of this particle. Probably uh, it's not a good scale because this particle should be, uh, in most of the cases, much more smaller than the uh, length of pack uh, molecules. Uh, well, in some advanced cases, uh, pegylation should be presented something like this one, and this is uh, very, uh, very similar to what we can see in nature. But uh, there are two types of pegylated structures on the surface of uh, nanoparticles. It can uh, one of them uh, is more like chaotic structure, like this one. And the second structure is called brush structure. So brush, it's like a brush uh, which you use to paint something. And brush structure is looks like something like this. So it's uh, pegylated molecules which placed uh, uh, perpendicular to the surface of your particle. But in most cases, pegylation looks like something like this. For you to give a better presentation here. So pegylated particle uh, randomly, chaotically covered in very long pack shells, uh, pack molecules. So this shell can be twice, three times bigger than the particle. And obviously this will add something to the particle behavior in biological media and in blood where, the, uh, where a lot of hydrodynamical processes occurs. So pegylation definitely uh, will do something to biodistribution, to toxicity, to some other uh, features of your particle. And yes, indeed, pegylation have some drawbacks. 
Uh, and if we look further to population strategies, there's a lot of them. It's not just take pack, take your particle, mix together and you pegylate your particles. Sometimes it works, uh, but in some advanced cases, you need to modify your pack molecules. For example, you need to add some uh, like sulfur groups, so sulfon pack. Uh, you, need, uh, you can add some uh, NH groups, uh, NH groups to your pack, so it can be some kind of pegylated proteins. Uh, you can use uh, amino modified packs, you can use uh, aldehyde groups with your packs. So it's a lot of strategies for a particular application for pegylation of proteins. So even proteins can be pegylated, polysaccharides, uh, nanoparticles, you obviously microparticles and so on. Uh, but uh, if we look on, and so uh, considering this and considering this, uh, obviously there are some drawbacks of pegylation. And for now, pegylation used mainly uh, uh, well, if you look on this uh, very list, uh, for now, pegylation uh, used for reduced clearance mainly and uh, decreased of immunogenicity. So, uh, because, because uh, on the very start of pegylation era, uh, there were some, uh, let's say, attempts to uh, use PEG uh, in application which are not uh, completely not suitable for pegylated particles. For example, transfection. Uh, if you cover your uh, nanoparticle or microparticle or liposome uh, in a PEG shell, uh, transfection efficiency will drop almost to zero because intercellular uptake of pegylated particle almost zero. So if you want to shield to protect your particles from uptake. So in case half-life of this particle in bloodstream, you need to pegylate them. So if you pegylate your particles, they will circulate in your blood for weeks maybe. Uh, well, maybe weeks, maybe days, but uh, this is not a very good strategy to increase cellular uptake of your particles. Definitely not. Uh, so abrupt release, uh, what uh, about abrupt release? So uh, when you, uh, design some nanoparticles to provide some release of the drug at the targeted site you definitely want uh, can want two types of release slow release so uh, gradual release of the uh, release of the drug uh, in tumor for example or very fast release of this drug and if you do not want fast release you probably don't want to use pack because pack can well, the shell is not very stable and if the, uh, something happened to this shell and the shell will open, the, uh, all of the duck will release from the shell. So uh, there's some kind of drawbacks. Well, it can be considered both a drawback and advantage, but in case of slow release, it's of course a drawback. Uh, and obviously it's size enlargement. So if your particle like 50 nanometers in diam uh, diameter, uh, upon pegylation can be 150, 20, uh, 200 nanometers, so it can increase twice, thrice, uh, four times, and so on. Uh, so if you need your particles to be smaller, or if you have some uh, target, for example, your particle sh uh, pegylated particles shouldn't be more than 200 nanometers. So initial particles, for example, if you have magnetite core or you have gold core, this gold core should be no more than 50 nanometers. So you uh, should bear this in mind. And uh, non-biodegradable. Uh, of course, PEG, uh, PEG is biocompatible because it's, well, not biodegradable. Uh, it can remain in some organs, in some cells for weeks, months, and even years. So uh, if this and other particles will accumulate somewhere, it can cause some uh, very, not very recent, but some delayed effects on your organism. So no one knows when this uh, pack will finally degrade in your kidney cells or liver cells and what uh, and in what will this result finally. And the most uh, tricky scene, the most important one, uh, when this era of pegylation just started, uh, scientists found that all of the particles, uh, maybe like 30 years ago, uh, all of the researches uh, was, uh, uh, let's say, uh, they will know that uh, most of the particles uh, cause uh, any kind, some kind of 
uh, immune response in organism. But upon pigulation, there no immune response from organism. So it's like uh, uh, immune system just switched off. And uh, there was the main uh, application of PEG uh, to protect uh, to protect your particles from immune immune system. But uh, maybe not very recently already. It's like uh, ten or fifty years maybe. It was found that even PEG have some uh, anti PEG antibodies. So uh, if we're talking about anti PEG antibodies, uh, it is very. Uh, maybe not very difficult but uh, you need to know something about uh, about uh, immune system so uh, if you look for example on uh, standard immune response uh, for PEG it uh, looks like something like this so you have first injection of your particle covered with PEG uh, they're going to the spleen mainly to spleen and there's some formation and release of anti-PEG antibodies so when you inject second time the drug covered in PEG this PEG uh, will very fast eliminate it uh, mainly by liver by Kruger cells or macrophages so when you first inject, inject uh, intravenously inject your drug in animal or in human uh, everything is good no immune response everything is perfect but second treatment uh, everything will be very very bad uh, and it can cause a very huge immune response from a, uh, an organism so no, why this was not found very uh, just uh, after the introduction of PEG? Because in our in vitro investigation or investigation with animals, there was a lack or a lack of uh, proper protocols. So uh, usually it was like a single ejection into mice and everything is okay. We just making some articles. But what will happen after second injection or maybe third or fourth injection? It was well something will definitely happen and uh, so it's like uh, 15 maybe uh, well probably like 15 years ago when scientists finally found that PEG caused some stone immune reaction upon a uh, second or third uh, intravenous injection or some other type uh, of uh, introduction of PEG into organism uh, and if we're talking about PEG uh, well PEG, uh, PEG itself uh, can cause of course immune response but you need to know that PEG in some cases have hepton like behavior so hepton it's a very small molecule so almost on uh, toxins uh, antibiotics uh, well uh, something smaller than 1000 uh, in molecular weight can be called hepton because these molecules can't co uh, in most again cases not always uh, uh, cannot cause uh, immune response in our organism so uh, for hepton molecule to uh, result in some immune response they should form antigen so these molecules can be uh, considered as antigen until they bound to some carrier molecule so carrier molecule may be for example protein uh, serum proteins like human serum albumin or something like this one and when hepton bound to some carrier molecule, it will form a complete antigen and this will cause immune response. So in some cases, PEG uh, possess the properties of hepton molecules, despite the fact that the uh, PEG have a very big molecular weight. So it can be like uh, 20 thousands or maybe even bigger. So PEG is really a really big molecule, but in some cases it needs to bound to something, for example, again, to proteins, uh, to form a complete antigen. So in some cases PEG uh, could not produce uh, immune response even after second injection, but in every single case you need to again uh, screen all of the immune properties, the immune reaction from organism in every case of your new formulation. Uh, but uh, okay, uh, I think it's clear about PEG drawbacks and we need to move a bit further to uh, polyamidamine. So polyamidamine, co uh, it's a well polymer again, uh, but this polymer have its own designation. It's called dendrimer. So dendrimer, it's uh, uh, well not every dendrimer is pamam, and uh, well pamam is a dendrimer. You, you should understand this. Uh, there's some uh, representation of dendrimer with different let's say with different size uh, but if you look uh, on these designations uh, uh, of course you will see 
that there are some uh, letters under every of this designation and these letters have a G in, in this designation. G is for generation. So uh, dendermers have uh, a very special uh, feature like generation. So what is the generation? Generation is an amount of branches uh, in a dendermere structure. So if you look, for example, on G4 or G5, you will see that the difference only in outer shell. So it's uh, a, lot of uh, a lot more molecules on the surface of this dendermere. Now, uh, and amount of this generation, well, generation is the division of the branch uh, into two pieces, for example. Uh, so it's a lot of generation for now obtained for PAMAM structures up to maybe even G7 or G8. So it's a lot of the structures. Uh, and uh, just for you to know how this looks on, for example, transmission electron microscopy, uh, it's look a bit messy because uh, it's like a chaotic random structure and uh, relatively big, to be honest, because uh, scale bar is just 10 nanometers and the whole structure may be like 60, 50 nanometers in diameter. Uh, so the dendermere, uh, maybe it's not a pure dendermere, maybe uh, it, this particle have some core, uh, as, as well as I said dendermere, uh, some, some complex, but this complex again, probably pure organic complex. Uh, but anyway, dendermere structure is very big and well relatively electronically den uh, denser. So uh, if you look precisely on dendermere structure, uh, it looks not very complex after all because, uh, well, it have a sim simple uh, element composition. Uh, but uh, you should know that dendermere have some uh, structural parts. This structural parts obviously a core of the dendermere, so a central part core. Uh, it's uh, nodes, as, well, as far as I remember, it's nodes when the dendermere branched. So it's a branches. Uh, and uh, on the end of these branches is like terminus or termini. So it's the end of the branch. Uh, and uh, if you look on this uh, structure, uh, so I, I'm not sure what this generation is, maybe one, two, like just two, two generation. So amount of nodes, uh, it's amount of generations. Now, uh, if you look on this structure, you, you will definitely see what the main ability of this dendermass, what's the main feature of this dendermass they have a very big surface area. So it's a lot of voids inside of this dendermass, a lot of spaces, uh, and this dendermass may incorporate something in their structure. Even if you look on uh, electron image, you will see this looks like a foam, uh, like a porous structure. Uh, and uh, of course, if you look on terminus of this um, uh, dendermere of PAMAM, you will see it's a lot of functional groups. So it's a very huge, uh, capability of bind something or bound to something. But uh, if you, for example, ask anyone, uh, any researcher working in the field of nanotechnology about toxicity of dendermers, especially a polyamidamine, uh, you will definitely hear that uh, PAMAM is fully biocompatible and used in many of the applications and everything is good. Uh, but uh, as I said earlier to you on the first lecture, if you want to find any sign of toxicity, you will definitely find something. Uh, and indeed, PAMAM is toxic. Uh, so despite the fact that it's fully biocompatible, it's still toxic. So everything is toxic, even water. Uh, but uh, uh, what was about toxicity of PAMAM? Uh, as I said, everyone will tell you that PAMAM is biocompatible, but back to 1996, it was already obvious that PAMAM have some toxicity. So 30 years passed uh, and the scientists still think that uh, everything is good. So you need to properly, uh, properly search a literature if you want to uh, well, so to say, to explain what you observe, for example, if your nanoparticles covered in dendermere possess some toxicity properties, probably, uh, probably you need to go to this paper and check what, what happens. But uh, to give you some examples uh, how the tricky can be toxicity, uh, we should go to uh, this paper. Uh, well, paper is very good to be say because it have for now like maybe 300 or 200 uh, citations uh, and uh, it's probably one of the first papers I cited ever in my PhD thesis. Uh, uh, not because it's very good paper but because it's uh, one uh, very good example of how the toxicity can be tricky. 
I mean, uh, on the trick, I mean, uh, how it's hard to understand what the real cause of uh, cytotoxicity, what, uh, and uh, to fi find this uh, cytotoxicity, because there are some features of the cells, it's CACO2 cells, uh, we will discuss maybe the cells uh, on uh, some of the next lectures. Uh, so these CACO2 cells, they have, uh, they ad adherent cells, so they form a mon uh, monolayer on the surface of your culture plates, for example. Uh, and uh, uh, this monolayer have some feature called electrical resistance of, uh, so trans-epithelial electrical resistance. Uh, because every single membrane of your cell have some electrical behavior, some uh, voltage, so uh, some charge, uh, the whole monolayer also have some electrical resistance. And this is an important feature when we discuss in some biological membranes or not even membranes, maybe endocellular cells, uh, some coverage of uh, the vessels and so on. So it's a, a very important feature and a very important parameter of cell viability, but uh, it's not very easy to measure this trans uh, epithelial membrane, uh, membrane electrical resistance. And well, the scientists made this and they showed that uh, this electrical resistance can be drastically uh, affected by PAMA. And more important for the difference between these, uh, between these uh, four pictures, the difference in generation. So the bigger the generation, uh, the more toxic the dendemer. So, well, in some cases it's uh, kind of obvious because as the bigger the generation, the more uh, different functional groups you have in your dendemer, in PAMAM, uh, the more functional groups, the more interaction with cell membranes, for example, and so on. Uh, and if you look on uh, LDH leakage, uh, lactate uh, dehydrogenase uh, assay, so leakage means that something leaks out of the cell. Uh, for example, some metabolites or some important molecules, and leakage, obviously, not very good sign. And if we look on PAMAM generation uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and uh, triton, triton is a surfactant uh, which is used to penetrate the cells. Uh, so triton is very, well, let's say toxic, so it penetrates cell membranes. Uh, and if triton gives like something like 100%, uh, the PAMAM of G4 generation can give like 200%. So PAMAM at this concentration of this generation is even toxic than, than most of the toxic agents used to penetrate the cells. Uh, and uh, well, uh, if you look, for example, on uh, time dependent uh, time dependence, uh, well, there's some kind of time dependence. Well, upon, uh, upon some time uh, passes, the toxicity decreases mainly because membrane heal itself. So uh, in a long perspective, maybe in a day or two days, uh, if we will not increase additionally increase concentration of PAMAM, the uh, cell will heal itself. But anyway, PAMAM has some toxicity at some maybe a very high concentration, but you should bear this in mind that even PAMAM, which is fully biocompatible, is toxic. But if we still want to use PAMAM in our application or something like this, of course, it's some kind of additionals, uh, additions uh, to PAMAM. And obviously you can, for example, no, well, again, uh, if you look, for example, on this uh, uh, histogram, you will see that in some cases PAMAM are very toxic. Uh, again, so some of the PAMAM structures are not toxic, but if you modify them with something, for example, in these groups, uh, they will definitely uh, become toxic. So it's not obvious result. Uh, because of this, you need in, in every case, you doing something to your particles, to functionalization of your particles, you modify, uh, for example, PEG or PAMAB, you need to check the toxicity because toxicity can uh, change uh, dramatically even if you add just uh, uh, change one group to another. And uh, when we're talking about PAMAM, of course, you can uh, modify, even PAMAM can be modified. So polymer modified with polymer, uh, for example, you can uh, cover them in PEG, but again, you should remember that PEG uh, also have some toxicity and PAMAM has uh, also have some toxicity and uh, two toxic agents. Well, maybe they will be less toxic. Uh, it uh, also can, uh, can happen. 
uh, but uh, say that existing will decrease, permeability will decrease, so uptake will decrease. Uh, well, there's some other like oscillation, uh, addition of amino acids and so on. So even polymers, what I want to say, even polymers can be modified to uh, for some uh, particular approaches of uh, pomon dendermers and so on. And well, again, if you want to read something additional about pomon dendermers and toxicity, well, not very syntactical, but uh, uh, advanced duck delivery reviews uh, not very long review but a uh, good one to uh, understand how to use a pamam in your work uh, well and now we are moving to probably probably after uh, after this one we will have a test so polymers uh, well both pamam and peg of course polymers but uh, the uh, the uh, usage of this uh, pamam and peg are so uh, so widespread that uh, they deserved a separate uh, separate talk but there's a lot of other polymers which used in different applications and i won't give you just a brief information about these polymers uh, so, uh, what about, uh, we, well, uh, we will start from this not very frequently used, but uh, hydroxyethylmethacrylate, uh, HEMA, and, well, very, very similar to him, HPMA. Uh, why these uh, polymers are very important? Because they are used now already for some, not maybe even years, for some decades, uh, they used uh, in uh, uh, dentist practice uh, and they are part of some polymers uh, used to uh, repair your teeth. So it's like uh, 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 my, uh, they are part of fillings for your teeth uh, because they are very compatible and well because of some other properties and no one well maybe some some years uh, in the in the past uh, of course uh, by compatibility of this polymers uh, was checked uh, were checked but but again if you want to find some toxicity you will definitely find it uh, and if you look for example on uh, cell viability upon uh, incubation of cells with uh, HMA protein or polymer uh, you will see well not very high but still cell viability decreases uh, but if we look precisely on uh, on the very cause of this decrease on gas H level, so gas H level uh, correlates with amount of reactive oxygen species, you will definitely see that uh, uh, HMA can uh, really decrease, and uh, BSO is just a positive control. So uh, this definitely will de uh, inc uh, decrease gas H level. No, so HEMA have a very good ability to decrease GSH uh, uh, compared to control cells. Uh, and again, if you look, for example, for apoptotic cells amount, uh, HEMA can, well, up to 10% of apoptotic cells. So now the question is, uh, and well, reactive oxygen species level can also be increased like to uh, up to 150%. Uh, so the question is, what will happen to your mucus layer in your, uh, well, around your teeth, for example, uh, when you use some kind of fillings uh, which uh, have uh, hammer in the composition? Well, probably something definitely will happen because it has some kind of cy cytotoxicity. The question is about amount of this HMA in uh, fillings uh, and in uh, material used, but uh, when you're searching for cytotoxicity, again, so, so, uh, again, I'm repeating all, not the, for the first time, uh, if you want, you will find. But uh, what you will find, uh, just look precisely on the uh, paper, not title, but authors, so just for surnames. And uh, if you will look further about toxicity of mescalate, you will find uh, a lot more articles about its toxicity, but again, look precisely on our source list. Uh, uh, Einstein, Einsteinson, 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 and again, this is the same people and almost the same year. And if you even look uh, a bit further, it's the same journal. 
Well, of course, we, uh, we don't have a right not to trust these scientists, but it's a bit, well, questions uh, why only them found that the hydroxymetacrylate have some toxicity and only during these years, like uh, uh, 2011, 2013, uh, 20, uh, 2010, and so on. Uh, so when you are looking for some kind of uh, signs of cytotoxicity of different polymers, you will, uh, you need to be very careful when you look in some information in uh, different researches because it's not very good journal. Obviously, even uh, even in, and it's not well. I cannot say it's not very good scientist, but you need to be very caution when you are reading these papers. Uh, so uh, we are now maybe. We're going further uh, and well about let me just give it a chat one second boom, 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 boom. so let's proceed uh, mm. Them. Yep. Uh, well, next, uh, polyethylenamine. Uh, uh, what's so special about polyethylenamine? Uh, well, it used a lot in different applications. Uh, for example, again, to cover some particles uh, uh, in, in this recent paper, well, not recent paper, in this particular paper, polyethylenamine coated albumine nanoparticles for BMP2 delivery. Uh, again, why, uh, why this paper? Because uh, this paper again uh, have a very uh, uh, large amount of citations. Uh, do not remember exactly, but still a lot. Uh, and uh, if we're looking for albumin nanoparticles, it's one of the frequently cited particles uh, articles. Uh, well, uh, what's so special about uh, polyethylenamine? Uh, uh, and these particles, obviously, uh, when you assess in the toxicity of particles, uh, again, we will discuss it more precisely in some of the next lectures. Uh, it's important to assess um, uh, two types of, uh, well, two components of your particles. Uh, the first component is uh, supernatant, so it's a liquid phase, and the second, uh, well, it's uh, some hard phase uh, because every no, uh, every colloidal zol it's a suspensional, so it phases. Uh, and sometimes toxicity can be associated with liquid phase, sometimes with nanoparticles itself. And in case of these albumin nanoparticles, as you can see, uh, pellet is completely, almost completely non-toxic. So MTT absorbance, MTT assay used to assess cell viability, metabolic activity. Uh, as you can see, almost all concentration are non-toxic. But in case of liquid phase, as you can see, uh, some of the concentration is very toxic and the uh, toxicity is very high. So even uh, at uh, some very first concentration, uh, as you can see, one milligram per milliliter, 0 0.6 milligram per milliliter. So uh, as you can see, this is uh, very uh, toxic amounts. Uh, but uh, what's so special about these findings? Uh, well, obviously, uh, these particles need a further uh, purification by, by uh, maybe by centrifugation, maybe by washing. So cycling washing followed by centrifugation. Uh, it's a common uh, uh, common way to decrease toxicity of your particles to eliminate some uh, non uh, non bind uh, in this case polyethylenamine molecules. But uh, when you uh, looking for some uh, literature data, you should pay close attention to what you really find because uh, uh, despite the fact this uh, article is very well cited, uh, just look at this plot. So look at these dependencies. Look at particular at these points. What with this standard deviation was what with uh, error of this uh, bar uh, of this bar. So. If you look here, this is a point, it's a positive bar, and where is negative, it drops below zero, so it was some, probably there was some results below zero, how it can be that 
the absorbance can fall below zero. It means that after uh, MTT metabolization, the signal drops uh, below control samples. It, it just can be. So uh, probably, probably, uh, we should uh, more precisely look at the protocols. Maybe there's some uh, explanation for this phenomenon, but uh, as for me, all of the, all of these particles, uh, all, all of these dots looks uh, not very well. For example, this one, where is standard deviation? Zero. Why, why in other points uh, it's uh, not zero and here it's zero? Why this point is so important? And especially uh, both of these points are uh, from, from different plots. Maybe it's just a zero me uh, metabolic activity. So it's so toxic in this concentration that there is no metabolic activity and this is zero point. But, uh, well, uh, you always uh, should pay attention when you're looking on some papers and uh, looking at the results, uh, because some results can be um, quite uh, strange. Well, so pay is definitely toxic, and this is not a first finding of pay toxicity, because, well, it's very well known that pay have some uh, toxicity drawbacks, and for now pay, well, it's still in some cases counted as biocompatible, but uh, probably better to use something else. Uh, well, what else? PLA, polylactic acid. So polylactic acid is very common and if we look uh, among all of the uh, other types of polymers, polylactic acid is may, may be the most biocompatible among all of them. Why? Because polylactic. So lactic acid <coughs> present in abundance. Uh, in some times now muscles. So uh, when you have a muscle pain after some physical exercises, it's uh, just because of uh, high concentration of lactic acid in your muscles. So polylactic acid is just a polymer version of this lactic acid. And because of this one, PLA can degradate to a lactic acid in your well, cells. Uh, but uh, despite this feature, uh, PLA, uh, well, lactic acid ha still have some toxicity because uh, it's uh, not very good when uh, when you have a high concentration of lactic acid in your muscles. It's just uh, uh, one of the type of physical training to have some damage done to your muscles by lactic acid. Uh, so uh, maybe in some cases toxicity of PLA will be not very high, but uh, what's so important? If you look on some uh, I just uh, take some citations from a paper because it's very, uh, very interesting uh, about, uh, let's say, formulations about the sentences. So, Pele naturally degrades through hydrolysis, uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, Pele degrades uh, slow degradation of Pele. So, uh, on one, uh, one hand, Pele can degradate, but on the other hand, degradation is very, very slow because uh, we don't have so many capabilities uh, for, in our organism to uh, fast, uh, fastly degradate PLA. So, and uh, one of the most interesting things here is that PLA is biocompatible in nature and uh, which, uh, and the next phase is very strange. It is non-toxic in nature. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, well, for me, it means that uh, some natural types of uh, lactic acid, for example, our own lactic acid, uh, non-toxic. So in nature, it's not toxic. But when you add some polylactic acid in your organism, well, uh, now it can be some kind of, uh, present some kind of toxicity. So uh, what uh, can happen uh, with polylactic? What one with polylactic acid? Uh, despite the fact that it, uh, it's maybe the most, again, most uh, mainly, uh, mostly uh, biocompatible polymer among all of other types. Uh, well, it's some very, uh, not very frequently discussed uh, feature of, for example, culture media or culture surrounding about osmolality. So osmolality, it's a concentration of ions and so on, uh, and uh, osmolality uh, well, of course, affect cell viability because our cells uh, uh, should grow in some uh, in some physiological uh, uh, surrounding, in some media, uh, in blood, for example, or in culture media, in case of in vitro investigation. And when uh, osmolarity is changing, uh, maybe not very uh, uh, strong, uh, very high changes, but still. Uh, 
it can lead to a cell death. So, for example, mannitol is one of the agents which used to uh, change the similarity in media, but if you look on, for example, uh, PLA-coated nanoparticles, in some cases, uh, they uh, can uh, change the similarity of the media because of a uh, large amount of free PLA. And if you look, for example, uh, uh, on correlation between osmolarity and cell death, uh, which was determined again by MTTSA, uh, we, will uh, we will see that uh, uh, the dependence is not very, well, it, it may be not very strict between these two uh, graphs. Uh, for example, in control samples, uh, what is TNF or uh, interleukin-6? Uh, both of these molecules, uh, it's a cytokines, uh, and the cytokines are a marker of inflammation. So if you look on control samples, uh, both uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha or uh, interleukin-6, uh, we will see that control samples are on the level of, of uh, 400 here, 200 here, but in all of the concentration of PLA, we will see some signs of inflammation and the increase like twice. So uh, uh, here we see that, uh, well, it's not very easy to uh, uh, read this plot, uh, but still you can see that the, uh, on this, uh, well, PLA, PLA performs almost the same as monitor and very high concentration. But what the real cause of this cell death is here, because PLA can cause inflammation in our organism, as well as lactic acid can cause inflammation in our muscles. So if you have a lot of PLA particles which accumulate somewhere in your organism, you will definitely will have some inflammation in this organ, uh, only connected with the enormous high con concentration of lactic acid. But uh, in some cases, uh, toxicity of these particles can be <clears throat> from uh, from another side, for example, uh, hemolysis. So hemolysis is a uh, disruptance, uh, destruction of your red blood cells, uh, and it's very uh, not very good, uh, not very good sign of uh, particles toxicity because they uh, present when you inject them in your bloodstream, they present an abundance in blood before they enter the liver. Uh, but in case of PLA particles. Uh, it was found, uh, of course, Triton, uh, Triton uh, have a very high uh, hemolysis rate, like 100%, because it's self penetrating agent. Uh, but in case of very high concentration of different PLA particles, it was found that uh, PLA can cause, also can cause a hemolysis. Uh, and the, uh, uh, let's say, border, uh, border uh, amount of uh, hemolysis is like 5%. Well, in some concentration, it close to this, but uh, if you look on this concentration, well, uh, it's still, it's very high because it's uh, microgram per milliliter and 200 mi uh, micrograms per milliliter is very high concentration. But in some cases, in some organs, uh, if nanoparticles will accumulate uh, uh, in liver, for example, in Kupfer cells, the uh, local concentration may be higher than this one, and this will cause uh, hemolysis, uh, for example, in liver vessels, and there's a lot of liver vessels, and different capillaries, and so on. Uh, but uh, despite all of these findings, uh, again, if you ask any of the researchers about PLA biocompatibility, everyone will say, of course, PLA is biocompatible, nothing will happen, bad happen to your cells, everything is good. Uh, and they will be correct because almost all researchers uh, in their work, uh, when they assess assessing toxicity, cytotoxicity of particles, they use just MTTSA, ATP, uh, 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 measuring of ATP level or LDH level or something like this one. And according, for example, to MTTSA, nothing bad happened to cells after incubation, even for 72 hours with PLA particles. 100% viability. The same for ATP level, well, ATP correlated with MTT, but still there's some difference here, but this difference is like maybe 20% of viability, it's it's nothing, just nothing. In case of LDH level, uh, well, the, uh, a very low um, uh, concentration by LDHSA is, uh, op you should read it opposite to MTT, so uh, LDH analyze culture media, not as cells, but amount of LDH in culture. Uh, and uh, as you can see, there's again no difference. Just don't look on uh, percent numbers. There's no difference between different concentrations. So if there's no difference, uh, it's uh, everything is good with cell. But if we look 
on uh, different peptides which expressed by the cell. Uh, it's a lot of peptides, proteins, which is expressed by cell. And many of them, uh, well, there's unclassified, uh, unclassified part, but if you look on uh, the main uh, proteins which participate in different, for example, oxygen transport, up to the stain response and so on, most of them are in any case upregulated or downregulated in the cell. Yes, overall uh, viability of the cell is like 100%, every cell is alive. But what happened to the cells on the level of separate proteins? Well, it's still, uh, still unclear because uh, what will happen if some proteins uh, connected with, for example, uh, I don't know, uh, ubiquitin conjugation pathway, for example, or no, protein import to nucleus. Maybe it can uh, in some way affect uh, cell division. Maybe it can cause some muta mutations or something like this one. So again, uh, when you will next time uh, read or hear about uh, that PLA is fully biocompatible, nope. Nothing can be fully biocompatible. Even our own uh, lactic acid is toxic to us. So there's always possibility to find something which is toxic to our organism. But uh, if you look further to this article and uh, looks to conclusion, uh, the author said that, uh, of course, the pathways uh, of PLA internalization could contribute to selective uptake strategies, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but uh, no cytotoxicity, no secretion of pro-inflammatory mediators were found here. But if you look here, obviously there was found some pro-inflammatory mediators. So between these two papers, there are already some, some change, uh, differences between findings. So uh, nothing can be just biocompatible or not biocompatible. Uh, but uh, you always should, uh, if you find something bad happen to your cells, you should go deeper to understand what is really bad happen to the cells. Uh, so, uh, Let's move uh, a bit further to proteins. So now we will discuss uh, mainly not uh, functionalization of particles uh, with proteins because protein functionalization, it's usually some proteins functionalized with some particles, something like this one. Uh, but in case of proteins, uh, uh, I think I should discuss with you some phenomena which I believe uh, Andre already discussed in uh, in his course of uh, biomedical application of different uh, particles and so on. So again, it's protein corona. But uh, I believe I can give you some something new about protein corona model. Uh, uh, well, I think all of you already knew uh, know what is a protein corona. So if you inject some particle in a bloodstream or just in some culture media which uh, have some proteins uh, in composition. These proteins will, ob uh, will obviously adsorb on the surface of nanoparticle, forming so-called a protein corona of the surface. Uh, and uh, this pro uh, protein corona, it's uh, well a, a, a relatively complex structure because uh, it it's, uh, forms randomly in bloodstream. So a lot of different things can affect the protein corona formation. Of course, it's uh, size, shapes of its potential of particles. It's different. Uh, it's the stability, surface chemistry, and uh, other things that can affect protein corona. And if we, uh, if you want to uh, look deeply about protein corona uh, behavior and impact on nanoparticles toxicity, uh, nanomedicine, a very good article, not very, not very recent, but still. And if we look uh, next, uh, what happens to protein corona? Because uh, you know, protein corona phenomena are known maybe for 17, 20 years. And even for now, some scientists think that uh, if protein corona formed on the surface of your particle, well, the protein corona is permanent. So it wouldn't move, wouldn't uh, change, something like this, but nope. So old model was like uh, protein corona adsorbed and after hours and after, after days, uh, this protein corona is still in place, but now it's believed that uh, uh, that uh, according to a new model, this protein corona can change, uh, and uh, this protein corona is uh, very, let's say, flexible uh, formation on the surface of the particle. So uh, if we look, uh, uh, what is so important about protein corona when you consider some nanoparticles application? 
for example, if you have some uh, silicon nanoparticles functionalized with some proteins, for example, on the surface, uh, pigmented proteins or something like this one, when, the, uh, when you enter this particle in the bloodstream, uh, all of these proteins on the surface will be mixed uh, with the proteins from your serum. So albumin, uh, globulin, and so on. Uh, and the resulted particle will be, uh, and behavior of this particle will be completely different. So if you want some, uh, for example, antibodies, antigens to bound to this particle, to this particle's proteins, they will not bind because there is not enough place for them. The, uh, all of the place uh, occupied by uh, human, uh, by serum proteins. And more important, uh, if you have, if you want these particles to, for example, enter some cells, so intercellular delivery, uh, after uh, after this protein corona coverage, uh, it will be completely different particles. So, for example, this complex, so protein corona complex with nanoparticles, with your targeted proteins and with some random proteins, will enter to this, uh, will enter the cell, for example, and uh, because some of these proteins are not naturally occurs in the cell, it can be some disruptance to cell metabolism because of unknown proteins. So you can bring something, well, maybe not toxic, but unnecessary inside the cell. So it can de uh, definitely will alter the cell metabolism and uh, cell behavior. Uh, and if we're looking on, uh, but basically, basically, it's now believed, uh, again, by some scientists, that protein corona can decrease toxicity of nanoparticles because it decreases uh, generation of active ox oxygen species uh, because of protein coverage, because this protein corona is, uh, in some cases, very hard. Uh, and more important, it can increase size of particles twice, again, as pigulation. Uh, twice, three times, so, uh, but in some cases, protein corona can increase toxicity and uh, uh, increase in toxicity of protein, uh, by protein corona is uh, not very well studied, but again, if you want to read more information about this, again, you can go to nanomedicine, but uh, just some examples of articles uh, which are connected with uh, assessing protein corona uh, connected with increased toxicity. Uh, so, uh, for example, some of the particles uh, and protein corona can unfold some of the proteins on the surface or uh, this protein corona can, uh, I mean, uh, proteins in protein corona can unfold and modify it in some very, uh, very unwanted way. So this unfolding of some proteins can cause immune response and very strong immune response, uh, especially in case there's a lot of particles. Uh, and if we look, for example, on formation of amyloid beta uh, fibrillation process, it's a reason for Alzheimer diseases. So if these particles will come to our brain and <coughs> we... Uh, and uh, before the introduction of our brain, we didn't assess their behavior and didn't assess their properties to, for example, alter some uh, conformation of proteins. Uh, we can trigger uh, artificial Alzheimer's disease in brain. So it's also a sign of uh, protein corona cytotoxicity. Uh, and uh, of course, of course, uh, if we look on protein corona, uh, different cells. Uh, different cells, especially macrophages, uh, they uh, uh, well interact with the cells uh, in different manner when we're talking about protein corona. So, for example, difference between monocytes and macrophages. Uh, monocyte can trans uh, transform to macrophage, and uh, if you look on cell, uh, cell associated with particles, so if you look on monocytes, Monocytes can uh, uh, associate with particles, while uh, macrophages can't. Uh, when the particles have some protein, well, opposite. Okay, when you have uh, protein corona, monocyte can't uh, up, uh, uptake your nanoparticles, but macrophages can. So, if you want to, uh, in some cases, when you, for example, talking about atherosclerosis, there is a monocyte and macrophages which involved in formation of uh, atherosclerotic plaques. Uh, and uh, there are some natural ways to deliver some nanoparticles, for example, to a cell sclerosis, uh, cell sclerosis plaques. 
Uh, and uh, in case you want to use monocytes or macrophages, you should know that there's almost uh, when you can use macrophages to deliver, but uh, in case of uh, monocytes, it will be not very easy to deliver something, uh, some nanoparticles because of protein coronary coverage. So because of uh, alteration of uh, this uptake, the bile distribution can be different for particles covered or uncovered in protein corona and bile distribution uh, definitely connected with cytotoxicity and uh, overall toxicity to your whole organism. Now, so yes, protein corona in some ways can uh, increase or decrease toxicity of the particles and uh, it is very hard to study uh, the exact mechanism of uh, decreasing or increasing of uh, particles toxicity and uh, because of this uh, because of this uh, investigation of protein corona is still under, uh, ongoing and a lot of papers published every year and so on uh, but we need again move further and discuss something connected with polysaccharides so polysaccharides uh, it's again a big uh, group of molecules and among these polysaccharides uh, we will discuss one of them uh, ketosan and ketosan mainly involved in formation of different particles uh, which are used well uh, for example in this way for used uh, the uh, ketosan was used to co uh, coat uh, iron oxide nanoparticles uh, but uh, well let's let's discuss a bit about this paper uh, if you look here uh, it's obviously then uh, that uh, ketosan coated iron uh, nanoparticles have lower toxicity uh, compared with uncoated particle, especially after 72 hours. Now, but uh, if, uh, is, uh, if I uh, remember correctly, this paper is about something connected with uh, mucosa delivery, something with uh, delivery uh, through nose and so on. And uh, why I check, uh, uh, why I use this paper as an exa example, because uh, look at the cells. It's a hella cells again. Please do not use hella cells. If you have any other options, not use hella cells now. It's in 2020 because it's uh, almost not non-human cells already uh, and uh, have nothing to do with the human cells. And again, lung cells, lung cancer, and uh, well, heck, uh, maybe the most suitable here, but. Uh, uh, we will discuss again in detail the same because uh, this uh, author's assessing nanoparticles toxicity which intended for use in different organs uh, compared to used, uh, used cells. So it's a lung cell, but lung cells probably will never come in contact with these particles. So uh, of course it's good, yes, cytotoxicity decreased, but well, it's not maybe not a proper model for assessing cytotoxicity. So, uh, if we look in here uh, again, uh, if you you ask anyone uh, if uh, ketosan is biocompatible or not, everyone will say yes. Of course, it's biocompatible. Nope, everything is toxic. I remember this. So, unmodified ketosan is toxic in some well, maybe a high concentration, but still it's toxic. Uh, but if you caught this ketosan in something like PEG, again, which is also toxic, uh, uh, as you remember, pegylated ketosan will be almost non-toxic, even some, uh, some 120% observation was found connected to cell viability. So if you want to uh, add some, uh, some uh, lower some toxicity, again, pegylation still works, but in some particular cases, because now, uh, uh, this paper again, uh, you, uh, nanoparticles produced here used uh, for delivery in nasal mucosa. So it's some particles which is used to deliver something through the nose. And ketosan particles are widely used only for this purpose. Uh, well, because maybe uh, because of some uh, uh, relative uh, behavior of ketosan to nasal mucosa, but, but I'm not sure. In case you need to deliver something not intravenously, but only to some mucosa, some epithelial layer, uh, you probably can use uh, pigmentation technique to decrease toxicity of ketosan because, uh, well, it have some uh, definitely have some toxicity. 
and uh, what I want uh, to give you uh, next some uh, very uh, uh, how comes it on the 25 uh, well uh, if you're looking uh, why so big a toxicity of kaitozan well it may be just a, a very very, a very big concentration of uh, very big concentration of kaitozan but uh, in some cases uh, it can be even a zero so if you add enough toxicant uh, toxicity can be a very very high so maybe this toxicity of kaitozan connected not with kaitozan at all but with uh, alteration of culture media composition so it's maybe just not very suitable for cells uh, to eat something like this one not to eat maybe some osmolality gain uh, changes or something like this one but uh, this paper here just for again example because uh, it's a cytosan pleuronic micelles so loaded with some anti-cancer drug for glioblastoma uh, treatment and glioblastoma located in our brain uh, and uh, it's not very easy to deliver something to the brain and chitosan particles with pleuronic uh, conjugates uh, can in some ways penetrate blood brain barrier and deliver something in your brain uh, but uh, why I check this article because you know, not all of the articles are very good to read and you know, when you open uh, it's just for you as a young scientist to understand uh, if you uh, prepare some manuscript some draft uh, and want to uh, send it to a journal uh, to submit it uh, you will probably need to stop at some certain point in your experiments so uh, there is no limit for uh, perfection if you want to perform every experiment in your life with these particles on every cell culture on every cell model with a, a, every uh, available technique uh, probably it's not very good because in this particular paper uh, there's nothing interesting uh, to, uh, to be said uh, well it's just well uh, well performed paper not an excellent and published not in a very good journal well still it's like maybe uh, six imp impact factor but still no, not a nature and technology but look no, first one uh, look at this, these images uh, if you send some, and this is high resolution image, uh, if you send something in journal, be sure that uh, you can distinguish separate cells in, on your image because uh, I, even I, with all of my experience, can't understand what happened to the cells. Is they alive or not, or bad or good, uh, and something like this one. But if we look uh, next uh, on presentation of this article, they performed a uh, cytofluorometric assay. Uh, they performed a very uh, so, put, uh, so a lot of uh, different histograms showing cell death based on uh, fluorescent staining and so on and they even performed some in winter investigation of different uh, so by distribution histology and so on and well it's a really big article and almost everything that can be done is done in this article still only 42 citations so if you want to perform every experiment uh, what you can uh, made with your particle with your object uh, you should understand that you must stop at some certain point making everything won't make your search better it's just uh, well just a reminder uh, okay we now moving further to biomimetic particles and uh, i believe this is uh, the last part of uh, my lecture what is so special about biomimetic particles? First, we of course need to discuss what is biomimetic after all, because uh, again, every research is, uh, as well as with hybrid nanoparticles, so organic, inorganic, hybrid, what is hybrid, so what is biomimetic? Uh, biomimetic, uh, as for me, uh, uh, mimics uh, and mimetics of something is not connected with, for example, shape. Uh, if you look on uh, this paper, uh, as you can see, it's uh, a lot of nanoparticles, uh, microparticles, basically most of them, no, no, not most, but still some of them are microparticles. Uh, so if you look on them, it's uh, called uh, bions. So bions because something connected with biology. And there's a lot of particles uh, with different forms, for example, sodium bions, uh, calcium bions, uh, alumina bions. Uh, copper bions uh, and so on. Why are they called bions? Because it looks like a bacteria. But 
if something looks like a bacteria, uh, probably some of you heard my lecture about nanobacteria, uh, and if something looks like bacteria, it doesn't mean that it will behave like a bacteria. Maybe in some cases, but not always. Uh, so if you ask me, biomimetic for me, it's something that have a functions of something alive. So it have some functions of a living organism or a living cell of something like this. Uh, for example, this article, uh, well, it's uh, same. I believe it's uh, almost the same journal as on the previous slide, but uh, a recent article, biomimetic particles and so on. Uh, well, if you will see, there's two steps to, uh, to obtain a final particle, but uh, do not be uh, uh, blind. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, uh, and uh, uh, I think not all of the steps are shown here. Uh, so to prepare these biomimetic particles, it's uh, what I want to say, it's very hard and uh, really complicated to make any biomimetic particles. So uh, yeah, it, it, it may uh, uh, sound uh, very easy to just, uh, well, hypertonic treatment and you obtain some membranes and you obtain some particles, mix particles with membranes and you obtain some biomimetic uh, surface modification. Nope. Uh, in this case, to, pr uh, to prepare some particles which looks like uh, erythrocytes, red, red blood cells, you need some template, uh, template approaches with PVA film, PDMS, uh, imprinting and a lot of steps to produce this very nice looking uh, like erythrocyte uh, particles from a uh, from silica template. So uh, after uh, obtaining some red blood cell membranes, so membranes is the main part of uh, membrane is the main part of uh, biomimetic particles mainly, so you're using this membrane to cover these particles and well this can be called biomimetic because it looks like uh, red blood cells and because of uh, some membrane receptors it behaves like red blood cells. And uh, the most important question is here, why you need so complex formulation? So what is the benefits of biomimetic particles? Now, again, if you want to read some additional information, it's a very good paper now in nanomedicine. So uh, very good journal, very good review. And uh, as you can see, it's a lot of different uh, classification of cell membrane coated particles. So most of the biomimetic particles is cell membrane coated. Uh, and uh, they can be used to erythrocyte cells, white, uh, white blue cells, different cancer cells, platelets, very, uh, very frequently used bacteria cells, and so on. Uh, and key features of these particles, as you can see, it's like high stability, uh, anti-tumor response, uh, well, uh, reduced stress capture, reticular endocellular system, so it's a liver, kidney, and so on. Uh, but uh, very interesting is that a uh, paper published in uh, 2017 and uh, will be, uh, well, RES is the old term. So for now it's uh, MPS, uh, monocyte phagocytic system. So I'm not sure how this passed to nanomedicine because it's very old term. Uh, so uh, uh, doesn't matter. Uh, why you need biomimetic you can see here so it pro mainly mainly it's a high circulation time and some targeted abilities uh, and some reduced stress capture mps capture so if you look on this uh, on this end for example on this one uh, again separate application of various type of particles coated in different membranes uh, so core of these particles can be of for example organic nature or with different iron oxide particles or it can be uh, gold nanocages, uh, silicon nanoparticles, mesoporous silicon nanoparticles, and so on, uh, and different type of membranes, for example, macrophages, membranes, and so on. But if you look on application, you will not see one we're discussing here, decreasing of toxicity, because this approach is way too complex to use it just to decrease toxicity. Obviously, in some cases, toxicity of these particles will decrease because of, well, lipid coating. Membrane, after all, it's just a bilipid layer. So after lipid coating of your particles, probably toxicity will decrease. But decrease of toxicity cannot be a single purpose of biomimetic particles. So uh, purpose of biomimetic particles mainly connected with delivery, circulation time, and so on. Uh, in some cases, it's, it's a very 
tricky application and uh, we will discuss this the last thing I will discuss with you because we are out of time. Uh, so it's a uh, red blood cell membrane coated particles uh, in form of red blood cells, obviously. So uh, this research is science advances this year, very recent, part, uh, recent paper. So this, uh, they take a spheres and uh, with different uh, shapes, so prolate ellipsoid and ablate ellipsoid. Again, uh, uh, you can see how they are actually looking. And uh, well, some of these uh, shapes are looks quite the red blood cells. Some are not. So they obtain these particles using a glycerol PVA and uh, obtain these particles, cover them in uh, red blood cell membranes and obtain some types like spherical, which is not very natural form, uh, ellipsoidal, which is close to red blood cells uh, uh, form and uh, some uh, ablate ellipsoidal. So uh, as you can see, they're a bit, uh, a bit bigger and have some, so they are like, uh, have a lower thickness, so they are not spherical. Uh, if you look on uh, TEM images, uh, they look very nice. You can see a membrane on the surface, uh, so uh, these structures can be called as core shell structures, uh, some core and some shell. And why these researchers need these particles? To decrease uh, some toxics, toxins in the blood. So red blood cells can be a target for some toxins, for example, snakes can inject in us with their teeth some uh, poison, uh, which will lead to hemolysis of red blood cells. And if you add some, uh, well, it's not the case of, of, of this paper, I think, but still, uh, if you add some additional particles, which will bind some uh, toxins, uh, the more red blood cells, your own red blood cells will survive. So you just add some uh, well, uh, well mis misleading to your blood to absorb some of the protein. But again, still we are talking about toxicity. Uh, what about by distribution of these particles? Again, everything goes to the liver. Despite all of the efforts, despite all, all of the membranes and so on, despite the shape, in this case, the, sh uh, the difference in shape are not very high. So yes, one is spherical and the other one not spherical, but still the shapes are very close. Now, despite the shape and so on, uh, they will all go to liver. Yeah, of course, it's some student, dist uh, student uh, distribution, it's a statistical uh, difference between these samples. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, these differences are not very high. So almost everything goes to liver, spleen, kidney, lungs, and even some to heart, uh, heart uh, but uh, that's because it's a red blood cell after all. Uh, and uh, more important here, uh, if we look on half-life, uh, so half-life, it's a, a, a time duration uh, for which uh, nanoparticles circulate in our blood. Well, some forms can really circulate for a longer time. So it's prolate ellipsoidal form. And if you look, prolate ellipsoidal form is the most uh, similar to our own uh, erythrocytes. So yes, in some cases it's beneficial. So it's like one hour and this is half like three hours. Uh, and why this is so important, I will tell to you in a week. Uh, lecture next Tuesday about why it is important because of spleen, obviously. Uh, so, and if you look on effectiveness of these particles, you see that some of the mice, I think, or rats, I don't know. So, some of the animals survived. Uh, this, uh, uh, I do not remember how this plot is called, but still a survival plot. And you can see some of the animals <coughs> which received uh, treatment with coated prolate or coated uh, oblate ellipsoids. Uh, they will survive the toxins and that's nice. Uh, but uh, again, uh, uh, I cannot uh, uh, just uh, skip this uh, very nice thing because when I found this article, I just look on corresponding after also uh, and uh, uh, gain JJ. Uh, I just thought, who is this? Just want to know who is, uh, who is this guy? And uh, when I found his profile, it's a professor, Jordan J. Gain. Uh, from a very famous uh, John Hopkins University School of Medicine. And uh, what's so important, uh, who's responsible for these biometric particles? 
Now, it's just for you to understand how this works when you come to a market. If you want to make some money from your particles, probably in the future. Uh, because this guy holding a uh, patent for a peptide particle delivery system, which will last uh, till 2013. And according to this pat uh, patent, uh, you are not able to produce almost any of polymer or peptide or biological any cotton particles in almost all of the forms. So if you want to produce some drugs uh, in form of multi-layer peptide polymer capsules, uh, well, you can't just make and sell because this guy have uh, rights for all of these types of particles since uh, 2008, uh, nine. So already 11 years. Uh, that's all I want to give to you.